Well, thanks, Amit and, and Doug, for having us. It's a, it's a real treat to be here talking about runs. This is uh, joint work with my two colleagues from the board, Nathan Foley-Fisher and Borgen Narajabad. Both of them are here today. Uh, given the issues are not completely orthogonal to what we care about at the Fed, the, the disclaimer apply that these views are not, do not necessarily reflect the view of the board or the rest of the staff. Now, the question we address in this paper, or at least try, is whether shadow banking is vulnerable to self-fulfilling run. Now, this is an old question in, in banking, but a question that, that has been tough to answer empirically. And the reason is that, as we know, on the one hand, investors or depositors might withdraw if they expect other investors to do the same, and if a widespread withdrawal implies a lower payoff for everyone. But at the same time, on the other hand, investors might receive bad news about the liquidity or solvency of their bank or their financial intermediary, or even receive bad news about their own liquidity needs, which will, of course, prompt them to withdraw as well. And clearly, these two things could be happening at the same time, but the result is the same. There is a run. Now, the defining characteristic of shadow banking is that compared to a traditional bank that, for example, takes deposit to fund long-term loans, Shadow banking usually consists of a chain of institutions that operate outside of the regulated banking sector, but that perform a similar type of financial intermediation. So for example, think about General Electric that needs to park a billion dollar cash with a money market fund. That money market fund take on that cash and then invest it in short term highly rated debt instrument like asset backed commercial paper or repo. What this means is that in shadow banking, they could be run by the cash investor on the money market fund, and we've seen this after Lehman fell and Reserve Primary broke the buck, but they could also be run by short-term institutional investors like the money market fund on the issuer of short-term debt instruments like ABCP and Repo. And we've seen this about a year before in the fall of 2007. And this paper focuses on this second type of run, the run by institutional investors on the issuer of short-term debt instrument. Now, we think understanding whether shadow banking is vulnerable to this type of self-fulfilling run is important because it implies different market mechanism. For example, if this mechanism were at play, it could mean that shock may either originate or at least be greatly amplified by the financial sector. And it also implies very different tools at the disposal of the regulator to promote financial stability. And I will come back to this issue at the end of the talk. So to reiterate slightly with a graphic, on the top of the slide we have traditional banking that we know is vulnerable to depositors run. The second, the bottom half of the slide is a simple example of shadow banking where money market funds, for example, are vulnerable to cash investors run but entities conduit like issuing ABCP are also vulnerable to run by the money market fund, a similar type of short-term institutional investors. And this paper focuses on this, on run uh, that uh, uh, happen in this portion of the chain. So what do we do? In this paper, we're going to study a run by institutional investors on US life insurance company. And that run took place in the fall of 2007. We're going to exploit a peculiar contractual structure of the securities issued by these US life insurance companies to try to tease out a self-fulfilling effect, a self-fulfilling component to that run. What we find is evidence of a sizable self-fulfilling component. And the key here is that this is not a test of fundamental based run versus expectation based run. This is a test of self-fulfilling expectation conditional on the state of fundamental. Now, this market, you most likely never heard of it, and, and was quite small relative to, for example, the ABCP market. But we think, given the run were coincident with the run on ABCP and the run on repo, we think that if we are able to somehow identify the self, a self-fulfilling expectation component in this run, it could be that the same kind of mechanism was also present in those larger runs that were so central to, to the crisis in the fall of 2007. But the key, again, is in those markets, identifying this kind of effect would be a lot harder than it is in the market I will discuss today. So the first thing is, how did life insurance company get into shadow banking? 
Before I answer that, let me pause and, and give you a bit of context of why Life Insurance Company became part of shadow banking. Now, to fix ideas, the traditional business of a life insurance company is to back long-term illiquid liabilities with safe assets, liquid assets of the same similar duration. Now, in order for that business to be profitable, they need to be high return on safe assets. Think about 10 years and 30 years treasury. And they need to be low risk-based capital requirements. What happened is these two things went south. So 10 years and 30 years treasury started declining rapidly from the 80s and then increasingly so in 2000s. And risk-based capital requirement were increased in the early 2000s. So the life insurer business, the traditional business, became a lot less profitable and insurers found different ways to increase their, increase their return on equity. One of these ways is to shift risk to off-balance sheet captive reinsurer. And of course, Ralph has a nice paper on this topic with, with Moto. Another way is to, fund, to finance portfolio of high-yield assets by issuing funding agreement-backed securities. And this is what I will talk about today. So this is how a funding agreement backed securities program works at a life insurance company. Now this is something that is specific to life insurance. It's not something you will find with other type of insurer. To be clear, the T account on the left hand side is that portion of the insurance company's balance sheet that is directly linked to the funding agreement backed securities program. The balance sheet is much bigger. It has other uh, insurance obligation and it has debt and equity and so forth. And it works like this. The insurance company issues a funding agreement to a special purpose vehicle. Now, a funding agreement is a type of guaranteed investment contract, or GIC. And if this doesn't really mean anything to you, think about it as a term annuity. And here, nobody is insured besides the SPV. So there is no mortality or, or mobility contingency attached to it. The SPV finances the purchase of the funding agreement by issuing notes to capital markets due to institutional investors. Those notes are backed by the funding agreement. Now the cash is passed through the SPV back to the insurance company and the insurance company uses this cash to invest in a portfolio of higher yielding assets. Think about mortgages, private label ABS and corporate bonds. Now the trick and the genius of the transaction is that funding agreements are not debt. Funding agreements are insurance obligation. What this means is that it is senior to all debt and in fact uh, holder of the notes backed by a funding agreement, those FABs are treated more senior than any other debt holder. In other words, th if you think about how a credit card um, ABS is structured with a top trench and an equity trench that credit enhance it, this is a little bit like if debt holder or credit enhancing the holder of these FABs. Now, practically what it means is if you're a double A rated insurance company, you can't fund yourself at AAA. Those FABs will get AAA rating. And then you're going to invest this fund that you raised at AAA into BAA rated security. So the spread doesn't have to be all that big for you to make a killing because this is a leverage trade. So you can get the 15 to 20 percent return on equity quite easily that way. Now, the FABS market really started in the late, mid, late 90s and then grew really rapidly during the boom years. And by our estimate, which I think are the best but still are likely to be an underestimate, we think the market picked at at least 160 billion in 2007. To put that into context, that's roughly the size of the auto ABS market in the US. Now, this structure is very flexible. It allows insurance company to tap different segment of capital market from long-term investors to shorter-term investors. And, and one way to uh, tap shorter-term investors is to e either shorten the maturity or to embed put option to these notes. And today I will talk about uh, the smaller portion of the market that was directly targeted to short-term invest investors like money market fund. And the type of FABs that is targeted to short-term investors are the so-called extendable funding agreement backed security. And I will spend a great deal of time going through the detail of these notes. But this is what the market looked like. It grew rapidly from about 2003 all the way up to about June 2007. And then all of a sudden, investors refuse to extend the note. Now what that mean, when you, when you hold an extendable FAB and you refuse to extend that note, what you, you're given a new security that will mature a few months from the date at which you decide to withdraw. So what happened here is we have the, the, the FABs market coming up, picking up at $23 billion. Remember that the overall market was $160 billion. 
Then all of a sudden, people stop extending their note and withdraw from the XFAB. These investors are provided a new security that matured about a year from now, and that's the green line crashing in about October 2008. Now, let me give you a concrete example of the terms underlying this security. This is an, an extract from a prospectus for an 800 million note issued by MetLife. This is issued on um, June 6, 2011. In the first couple of pages of the prospectus, this is what you'll find. You're going to find an initial maturity date. In this case, it is July 6, 2012, exactly 13 months from now, meaning that if you are a money market fund, you can hold it. Then there's going to be a final maturity date. This is a date at which the note will mature no matter what happened to it, unless it is withdrawn from before. The, mat the final maturity date is about six years from now. And then there's going to be uh, an election cycle. In this particular case, the uh, first election will come up a month, exactly a month after issue, and will be recurrent every month, on the sixth of the month. During that election, the investor can decide whether to withdraw or to extend the note. By default, it is extending, but if it calls the dealer, it can decide to withdraw. The investor doesn't need to withdraw everything. It can withdraw any portion. That portion of the note that is not extended is then converted into a new security that pays zero coupon and will mature at a fixed date. Now, what this means is in this particular market of extendable funding agreement backed securities, we have a sequential decision making. Investors need to make, as a, in contrast to a bank where people run typically simultaneously, here there is some, some element of sequential decision making. Let me try to put this in, in context with a, with a timeline. Think about a single insurance company for now that is issuing a number of XFABs. Let's index the XFABs by I. Let's say there's a number of investors. They are indexed by IOTA. And I want you to think about the investors as a money market fund manager. The money market fund manager mostly cares about two things, the rating of the, on the, the investment and being paid on time. That's crucial when you're operating with no capital. So think, take one of these XFAB, I, and first election day T comes up. Investors need to, need to decide what, how, to withdraw or not. Let's call D the amount withdrawn at that time. If the investor withdrawn, or the portion that is withdrawn at that time, will then come due at T plus M. Of course, the expectation is to be paid at T plus M, and things could happen in the meantime. In the meantime, the insurance company is also servicing other claim it has, claim coming from its extendable fabs market, claims coming from other regular fabs, and so forth. Now, if the investor chooses to extend the note, then of course it has another, another shot at T plus one. But in between T and T plus one, there could be other extendable fabs coming up for election from the same insurer. And then that investor may start thinking about who, whether people holding these X fab will withdraw as well. In other words, this investor need, might need to think about how much, how many people will withdraw when he cannot withdraw and when he has to wait until T plus one. In the meantime, the amount that can be withdrawn between T and T plus one is by definition bounded. It's either zero because uh, uh, no one is withdrawing, or it is a maximum amount which is given by all the XFAB that were issued by that insurer. Now, at that point, if the, per, if the investors decides to withdraw at T plus one because he didn't withdraw at T, then those guys who withdraw between T and T plus one will have to be serviced before he get a chance of being paid at T plus M plus one, okay? Now, in a paper, we, we formalize this decision making into a basic model. And the goal of the model is to show the condition under which there could be a self-fulfilling run in this particular market. Now, I won't go over the detail of the model, but the result is the following. It boils down to an externality. If, they, if withdrawal imposes an externality on other, there could be a self-fulfilling run. And it goes a bit like this. If an investor's withdrawal affects the expected future liquidity of the insurer, there could be a self-fulfilling run. Why? If the investor expects other investors to withdraw, this would be the expectation of this ST plus one, then she may start to worry about the insurer's future expected liquidity. 
Those concerns about the insured liquidity might lead to withdraw today. That's the D here. But this D adds to the queue of payment. This withdrawal may affect the expected liquidity of the insurer that would then prompt other investors to be concerned and withdraw, and that will confirm the original expectation. So the intuition is quite similar to the concept we're familiar with, but the goal of the model here is to show that, at least in theory, it can happen. Now, alternatively, there's a run could happen for another reason. Obviously, there could be worsening fundamentals going all the way, and what we will get is a positive correlation between withdrawal today and withdrawal between T and T plus one. The identification problem we face is the following. What we are interested in using this notation is the effect of expectation of future withdrawal on withdrawal today. The effect, the effect of a change in expectation of ST plus one on DT. We perfectly observe withdrawal decision for all these XFAB. In other words, we perfectly offer, observe D, ST plus one, and the Q. What we do not observe are the expectation of ST plus one. And of course, what we observe some fundamental, for every fundamental we observe, there is a bunch that we don't. So in, a, in the remaining of the talk, I will convince you that we found a way to try to tease out this, uh, this mechanism. Now. The unit of observation throughout the analysis will be the election T of an XFAB I from an insurance company J. So every, every measurement will be always with respect to a particular security. The basic specification has DIJT on the left hand side. This is a slight abuse of notation because here we're normalizing all the variable by the size of the market at election day T. But if you allow me to do that, D IJT is the fraction of X fabs I from insurer J that is withdrawn on election day T. Our endogenous variable here is this I S I J T plus one. It's the fraction of X fabs that is withdrawn between T and T plus one. And then there's the Q. Q coming from either the X fab program or the rest of the fabs program. And then to this kind of specification, we can add a number of control. Now, in general, no matter what the cause of the run is, we expect D and ST plus one to be correlated during the run. And in fact, if you were to run that regression, you'll find this. You could try to control for obvious fundamental by adding them to that specification. You hope that correlation survives, and it does. But no matter how many control you add, that correlation alone cannot be informative for the presence of that self-fulfilling component to the run. So what we need is an instrument. We need something that is related to the expectation, but that, that is really orthogonal to the fundamental. So this is how we do it. We're going to construct an instrumental variable using the features of the contract. Our basic identifying assumption is, um, is basically rational expectation. It is that those expectations of ST plus one that we don't observe are not completely orthogonal to the equilibrium withdrawal that we do observe, the ST plus one. If this holds, we're in business. Now, this is this timeline again, again, with respect to a single X fabs, but now augmented to signal there is multiple insurer. These, those are indexed by J. What we need is a variable that is correlated, again, that is correlated with expectation but uncorrelated with fundamental. Our point of entry here is going to be this, this RE. It's going to be the, this upper bound, the maximum fraction of X fab that can be withdrawn between T and T plus one. Now think about what this number is in normal time. In normal time, ST plus one is zero. There is no withdrawal. But this RET, this upper bound, this maximum fraction of X fab that can be withdrawn is moving up and down. And these fluctuations are determined by how many X fab are out there and for how many years they've been out there. In fact, the more X fab we have with, the, with more and more overla non overlapping election dates, the more fluctuation we will have in this RE. Now, once the run starts, that's when this S and this RE start to become positively correlated with each other. This RE will continue to have some variation that were predetermined before the run, coming out of the issues months or years before the run started. But there are going to be two additional developments on that RE. 
One development is mechanical. As people are withdrawing, there is less up for election. So this R is going to mechanically decrease during the run. Now, of course, if people are withdrawing because of bad fundamental, then that R, the decrease in R is going to be correlated with, with fundamental. Another thing that could be happening is that there could be new issues. So as the run starts, some insurance company may, may, may want to may gamble for resurrection by issuing new notes. In this case, RE will increase, but the increase of RE will be a response to negative fundamental. So what we want to do, our goal here, is to look at RE, and we want to retain those variations in RE that were determined in the month and years before the run, and remove all the development that are associated with the run, both the decrease that is mechanical and the increase that will come from new issues. So one way to do that is to measure RE three months in the past. Why three months? Because the run, most of the run happened within three months. What we want RE to be is by the end of the run, when you look at RE in uh, January 2008, that RE did not contain any uh, variation coming out of withdrawal or a new issue. And this is going to be our instrument here. What we would like to do is take our endogenous variable ST plus one, that is a function possibly of expectation and most certainly of fundamental, and project it on that RE whose variation have nothing to do with fundamental because they are coming from the month and years before the run. And what we would be left with, we think, is a measure of uh, those expectations. So, let's pick on MetLife. So to give you a bit of an idea, let's, let's think, for this instrument to be any good, there need to be tremendous variation in RE. Now, if every note was issued according to the term I just showed you earlier, that MetLife 800 million note, which had an election date every month, let's say you had like 10 of them issued by MetLife with the same, not the same, but at least a monthly election date, maybe on different days, then we would have no variation in RE because at every election date, the same fraction would be up for election. What we want is variation in the length of election, the period of election cycle. We also want variation in the issue. Now, in that previous note I showed you, the, ele the first election came one month after the issue. That can vary a lot. That can vary a lot. For example, the first election could be one year after issue, or it could be even longer, or it could be less. And at the same time, what we call the election window, the time during which there could be election, that can, that's usually stops before some month before maturity. And that creates another source of variation in RE. So when this program has been going on for many years, what we have is tremendous variation into how much come up for election on every given election date where the reference point is a single security. So this we try to illustrate with MetLife. Think about the timeline referring to the top line. Before the, before the run, we, the circle reflect different X fabs. The, the size of the circle would be, for example, different amount. Then the run starts past around August 2007. The fraction D is withdrawn. Here, our S's will be that fraction that is withdrawn in between T and T plus one, and the RE will be that fraction that is up for election between T and T plus one. But that RE will be excluding any new issue. So if there was a new issue here, we will remove it. And it will also, going forward, remove any development coming from the run. So for example, after this episode, that piece of the pie that was withdrawn, we remove that development and we keep RE at its original size, the size that was observed before the run. Now we do that for every insurance company, and what it gives us is this kind of panel. We have multiple insurance companies. Here's MetLife Allstate and New York Life. And they each have a bunch of different XFABs with overlapping, non-overlapping, election cycles, different size, different terms. And what this allows us to do is to, to use fine control both for the insurer, but also for the time. So in our analysis, we can go as fine as using weekly, weekly fixed effect, for example, because we can just focus on that weekly variation in withdrawal. So now a word about the data. So what we have is the universe of all US fabs at a daily frequency. This is the $160 billion market I was referring to earlier. Now, here we focus, we use, while we use everything, we really focus on the extendable fabs. What we have is 13 life insurance companies 
65 XFAB issues and 170, sorry, 170 spin-offs. What we, we, what, what, a spin-off is what you, what you get when you withdraw and you're given a new security. For each, secu for each security, we have a QSIP, we have an issue date, we have an initial and final maturity, and we have the election date. For every election date, we have the amount withdrawn, the amount that was spun off. Now, importantly, every spin-off is matched <coughs> to its parents. Every spin-off is issued a new QSIP. So you just have to, well, you don't just have to, but you start with an original QSIP, and then you figure out what happened to that QSIP, and then you reattach the spin-off QSIP to it, and now you obtain the entire life of that security. To that, we have a bunch of other things coming from statutory filings and ratings, CDS, VIX, and so forth. The sample period here is going to be beginning of 2005 until the end of 2010. What this gives us is about 1,300 insurer security election date observation. And this is what we get. So the first two columns is are the result for our baseline specification, where we instrument S with this RE excluding three months. What we find is a strong and significant coefficient on that S. And I'm going to hold off on the economic interpretation for now. For now, the, one of the concerns we have in this analysis is that the industry, the insurance industry, could be experiencing a common shock, a shock that would hit every insurer. One way to deal with this is by including weekly fixed effect. At least this is the finest we can do. We claim that our instrument should not be correlated with bad fundamental, but if it's true, the weekly fixed effect should give us broadly the same results. So by including the weekly fixed effect, we get broadly something, something that is broadly similar. To put these numbers in context, this is what we get. In the paper, we run different specification. Um, we use different lag for the instruments and different types of control for uh, maybe latent fundamental. What we find is that between 62 and 80% of this 18 billion withdrawal can be attributed to a self-fulfilling component. Again, remember that this is not a test of self-fulfilling expectation versus fundamental. This is a test of self-fulfilling expectation conditional on the state of fundamental, whatever that might be. I get no questions. I, I th I'm imagining that this might sound convincing, but we were not that convinced in a paper, and we, we went through a, a couple of robustness tests. One thing we're concerned about is, is whether the market was, was in fact fragile by design. Whether, in other words, we were concerned that maybe insurance company thought that they were doing something risky that was prone to run. If that was the case, that, our instrument wouldn't be very good because the fundamental would be bad to start with and those variations in RE would be really bad fundamental. One way to look at this is to compute RE not just excluding three months, but measure it at the issue of a, of a given note. We call that this RE measured at issuance, meaning that the, mar the market of RE is what it is, the note is issued, what would be the market with that variation RE during the run? This, if the market is not designed to be fragile, should be widely uninformative for our withdrawal decision. What we find seems to be the case. If we were, if we were using this as an instrument, it is weak, it is uninformative in the first stage, and it gives us nothing, nothing in the second stage. The second big elephant in the room here is the time persistence of the instrument. It could be that what we're getting at is only driven by, uh, by the time persistence of RE. And in fact, uh, if you measure the autocorrelation in RE, you find that it's highly correlated, about 80%. So if the, those results are driven by autocorrelation, then it has nothing to do with expectation and everything to do with the past. One way to test for it is to measure RE not between T and T plus 1, as we do, as our instrument is constructed, but between T and T minus 1. This is the lag RE, if you wish. This reflects past development, and it should contain, in, if what we say is any good, it should contain no information on expectation, even though it is highly correlated with uh, future RE. If you use this, this, um, this lagged RE as an instrument, you get the instrument is weak by a Stokoe-Yogo measure, but you still get this, this strong correlation in the first stage. 
But in the second stage, you get absolutely nothing. So it, it can, this is, whatever we're picking up cannot be coming from time persistence in that RE. The other elephant in the room is really that insurance company are not, we have fixed effect at the company level, but they could be experiencing different idiosyncratic shock and that this shock could be persistence. For example, it could be that MetLife is a lot more creative than Prudential and so it's facing different shock. It could be that MetLife is more aggressive when selling viable annuity than the other insurance, so it's facing different kind of difficulties. One way to deal with this is to go into insure time fixed effect. And the finest we can do here is insure month fixed effect. Once we include this uh, time varying fixed effect, we get that the results are broadly the same. In fact, statistically, those coefficient on the S instrumented by RE are not significantly different from one another. Another thing is, well, fine. We find something that seems to work, that's RE. As a placebo test, we would like to know if anything that is predetermined, like RE is, would work as an instrument. And one candidate, which would be a terrible instrument, but that would be something that is predetermined by that market, is the Q. The Q is clearly not a valid instrument. It is clearly reflecting, could be reflecting fundamental, but it's something that is predetermined. If we use that, that Q in a specification, what we get is, is nothing. It, it is completely uninformative for withdrawal decision. Uh, in, in between t and t plus one. It is informative to the extent that it might reflect fundamental, but it contains no information as far as the expectation or concern. And they really shouldn't be. Uh, th this, is, this is under the header of robustness, but really we have no data to back. This is more like a theoretical argument that we developed in the paper using the model we put forward. Now, the, looking at this literature on run in, uh, in, uh, in the 80s, one paper that I, we think is very important is the one by Jag J Chari and Jagannathan that say that, well, an informed investor could be just acting on the action of informed investor. And that's certainly something that could be happening here too. And that the question is whether this intrinsically will undermine our, uh, our, estimation, our, our estimation strategy. And so here is really a, a uh, just a qualitative argument. What you can show in that, in that model of XFAB, the model that can have a self-fulfilling run, what you can show is regardless of the heterogeneity in investors' information about fundamental, they could be a, a self-fulfilling run if and only if there is a withdrawal externality. And this, in the paper, at least it's an if and an if statement. And the intuition is very straightforward. Informed investors behave exactly as I described earlier with that earlier proposition in bold. They, their expectation can only be self-fulfilling if there is a withdrawal externality. Now, those uninformed investors, they can certainly act on past change in the queue. They can see the queue forming and say, oh, gee, maybe that's, that's a bad signal. But they cannot be forming self-fulfilling ex expectation if there is no externality, if the, the withdrawal they have is not affecting the expected liquidity of the insurance company. So at least from a qualitative point of view, we are not concerned this is an issue. So let me, let me give some concluding remark. So what we find here is, is evidence of a sizable self-fulfilling component to this run on this peculiar market in the fall of 2007. What we think is key here is that the same institutional investors were active in ABCP and repo and that this market experienced the run at the same time. Now, the issue is you, it is, would be very difficult to identify the self-fulfilling effect in those markets, if anything, because of fire sale. Fire sale by themselves will be, uh, uh, um, um, uh, would be something that would make the fundamental creep in your analysis. We did not have a risk of fire sale. We had a risk of fire sale, but we did not have a fire sale. What happened when this note came due in late 2008? Well, if there is no liquidity out there, one option is to start selling this thing. Now, selling this asset in 2008 was really probably not a good idea. Those insurance companies, those that were operating FAB's program, went to the federal home loan banks and either became a member or jacked up their membership or just took advances. The way that life insurance companies take advances is is quite unique. What they do is they issue a funding agreement to the FHLB. In other words, what happened 
when this node came due is that this, this link of the financial intermediation went from funding agreement back security to the FHLB. So the business that was initially funded with FABs became funded by FHLB. At the same time, what the FHLB was effectively is a very important backstop during the crisis and in fact prevented a fire sale in that market. This is something that helped us tremendously because it, it, it really rules out uh, the possibility of a fire sale that will really uh, uh, confound our result. At the same time, the, the question we have is like, well, at, at least at the beginning as well, if there was such a liquidity backstop, why was there a run in the first place? The thing is that the FHRB was under tremendous stress at that time. And there was, in fact, tremendous uncertainty whether the system would survive. Banks have been taking <laughs> tremendous advances, really gambling for resurrection during 2007. And some people were really concerned that the system had actually fell. Instead of extending the notes, they took these advances, or they did both? They extended the notes? The notes were not extended. They never extended them. The, no the notes, the no Institutional investor refused to extend almost all notes. Then these, the, that fraction that was not extended yeah. came due in October 2008. That was the one-year delay. Exactly. They did, did use the one-year delay, and this happened after the one-year delay? <laughs> exactly. So if you look at here, okay. it started going in two, yeah. quarter for 2004, and then quarter for 2008, the peak yeah. hit. Now, because we have a bit of time, and because I thought it was so impressive, most people use the FHLB, and MetLife used the FHLB more than anyone else. MetLife had the biggest extendable funding agreement back security program out there, about $5 billion. The, the overall business was about $30 billion. They also had $30 billion in sec lending, and maybe half of it was connected to the FABs, but that's almost beside the point. What MetLife did, which was truly remarkable, while everybody went to the FHLB to get liquidity, MetLife restructure the FABS program, or at least the extendable FABS program, into a funding, funding agreement back commercial paper program. And they started issuing this FAB CP directly to the Federal Reserve <coughs> because the CP facility was in place at that time. So for MetLife at least, the Federal Reserve was the backstop that prevented that, uh, that, uh, that fire sale, possible fire sale of assets. Now, as it turned out, Moody's didn't want MetLife to issue more than $4 billion in FabCP, but they needed $5 billion. So what we observe MetLife to do is they issue a billion dollar putable FABs to the market, which is really the riskiest way. It's essentially issuing demand, demand deposit right in October 2008. And they survived. And since then, the FabCP program is about $10 billion. So it didn't go down, actually went up. In fact, since the designation, <laughs> that program kept going up, even though uh, people working on the designation did mention that that might be a problem. So going back to the conclusion slide, we believe that what we found in that market is, is plausible. We believe there is a plausible self-fulfilling expectation component to that run. We think that it is quite possible this effect is present in larger markets that were so central to the crisis. But one thing we have problem reason reasoning with or what kind of, what does it mean for regulator? There has been tremendous progress on, especially from the SEC, on reforming money market fund. And the idea here is to mitigate the, the run risk on the money market fund. But there hasn't been really much or anything on trying to prevent the run by the money market fund on everyone else. Now, the problem here is that if we think about bank runs, we, I think we know how to deal with bank runs. We have the FDIC and we monitor bank. We monitor the hell out of it. The problem is here, we can't have deposit insurance <laughs> on this kind of market. And this is just symptomatic, symptomatic of a larger problem. For, for any XFAB market that pops up and is shut down, another market will be here to deal with another regulation. And so it will make it almost infeasible or ineffective to, to cope with these changes we wouldn't be able to constantly monitor accurately the development of this market. For example, think about JP Morgan. JP Morgan is putting out this repo back CP right now. Why are they putting back repo back CP? I don't know. It's clearly going around some sort of regulation. We have no idea. So this might sound a bit grim, but that's uh, what we, we think we've learned from, from that paper. Thank you.
Okay, well, thanks a lot for um, um, for asking me to discuss this this paper. Um, and given that we have two discussions, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus more on the insurance aspect of this of this paper um, because if you read this paper, it's very much presented as as a bank run paper, a shadow banking paper. Uh, but some of us have an idiosyncratic taste and like insurance, uh, which I think is also important, and we should uh, should also pay attention to those aspects of that paper. And I think actually it makes an important contribution in in that literature. Um, so let me sort of like take a step back and, and, and sort of think about what are the risks of, of a modern life insurance company, where does this fit in into the, the broader literature on, on insurance. So traditionally insurance companies are, are relatively boring entities, so they're, they're exposed to, to three types of risks. So on one hand you have interest rate risk, you have aggregate longevity and mortality risk, and then you have shifts in policyholder behavior. But insurance companies have, have decades uh, of experience managing those, those risks. Now, modern insurance companies are still exposed to those, um, to those risks, um, but the balance sheet's changed a lot the last, let's say, 20 years. And this is really for two types of developments. So on the one hand, they started to sell at a large scale, uh, much riskier products, um, so-called variable annuities. Um, lots of them also sold, sold in, in other parts of the world, not just the US. Um, and these products have minimum return guarantees. So think of them as, as mutual funds uh, that have very long um, uh, maturities, like, like 30 years, where you guarantee a certain rate of return. And as you can imagine, currently there's a lot of pressure on insurance companies who have issued those, those securities uh, or these, these insurance products uh, with the current low interest rate environment. Now the second part that changed the balance sheet, and that's where this paper fits in, is that insurance companies use new tools to manage capital. And in particular, they started to use these off-balance sheet entities. So they started to do shadow, shadow reinsurance, which is um, reinsurance between affiliated entities. So let's say MetLife reinsuring itself. Uh, which was mostly done for uh, regulatory capital uh, reasons and for tax reasons. Secondly, insurance companies became large in, in securities lending. I'm going to show you some, some data on that. Then they have these, these funding agreement based notes um, and extendable versions of those. And they, became, um, um, they started to use derivatives a lot more, both to hedge interest rate risk, but to also hedge uh, the guarantees in these, uh, in these products. So, that's kind of a, like a small but growing literature that tries to argue that, that tries to think about the risk regulation and frictions in, in insurance markets. And I think this paper fits in very nicely in that literature as well, uh, mostly because we really have a hard time or trying to figure out what insurance companies are actually doing because they're really very different from the traditional insurance companies that we, um, that we, uh, that we know. Um, so the, the structure was, was already mentioned a little bit. So um, effectively what's going to happen is that the insurance company is going to issue these, these, these policies to this SPV, issues notes, you get the proceeds from the note holders, let's say the money market mutual funds, you get those proceeds back and then you can start in investing those in all kinds of securities, uh, potentially illiquid ones. Now why is this paper so important is that if you, um, um, if you talk to regulators at this point, like one of the key questions that, that people have is to what extent insurance companies are, are systemic and, and what potentially uh, the spillover effects are if an insurance company fails to other parts of the financial sector. And one of the key questions there is to what extent insurance companies are really different from banks, uh, and in particular how runnable the liabilities are. So how quickly can policyholders surrender their policies or, 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 or things like that. And this paper of course fits in very well where you build in this liquidity mismatch risk, um, and some early work on this is by, um, uh, by Paulson and co-authors uh, from the Chicago Fed, um, who also discussed these, these, um, these vehicles already and mentioned that those are a potential source of, of liquidity mismatch. Okay? Now, in terms of total balance sheets, these, these numbers are going to be small, as I'll, as I'll tell you in, in a little bit. Okay. So you've seen this big run, so you start sort of seeing this in, 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 in late 2008. Key question is, is this coming from, from fundamentals? And here, um, there's two, two ways of thinking about this. So on the one hand, you can think about the failure of an insurer or for some reason like, like insurance companies run out of liquidity and there's some dis disruption or delay in, in the payments. Now, I'm not sure this is like a huge issue because if you look at what happened during the financial crisis and you look at the balance sheets, these insurance companies did have significant amount of liquidity and in fact those companies that seem to be most constrained, um, they, they rebalance their portfolio towards very liquid securities. Um, but I do think there was significant stress during during the, during the financial crisis, and I'm going to sort of give you some evidence of that. So I think there was a reasonable concern about some of these insurance companies. And then there's the alternative or complementary story, um, which is about the self-fulfilling run. So really believes driven, conditional on or in addition to uh, the story about fundamentals. 
Now, in the theory part of the paper, the way sort of they model this is to say there's some state variable n, which is measuring the liquidity of the insurance company or, or the solvency. And this is going to be affected by two things. One is this Q, which are the payments made uh, from, the, um, from the SPV to, um, let's say, the money market mutual fund. And it is affected by the returns, which is, which is interpreted as, as fundamentals. Now, this NT goes into this, this, this F, which is the probability of, of insolvency. So if N gets too high, it becomes more likely that the insurance company fails. Um, now, the key thing they want to show is that that current withdrawals depend on the expectation of other people uh, potentially running on the, um, on the SPV in, in, in the future. Key empirical challenge is that you don't observe this expectation. And then in the paper, there's two empirical strategies um, that give you quite, quite similar um, results, actually. So, so that, that's comforting. So one is to simply remove the expectation, regress D on the future value of S, um, but then, of course, as, as, uh, as Stefan explained also in, in the presentation, that, that has issues because you introduce an errors and variables problem because you, re you use a realization rather than the expectation. And, of course, this one can be correlated with, with fundamentals. Okay? But then they have this very nice IV estimate that I'll get back to uh, later, on, later on as well. So this is kind of the main table that I think is actually the, um, the most interesting one, which is not the one that's in the paper that you have, but uh, they told me it will be. Um, so effectively what they do, is, as I told you, is they excluded the most recent three months in the construction of the instrument. Because anything that happened during the last three months is going to be contaminated with fundamentals. But three months is relatively short. If you think about standing in, let's say, uh, June 2008, then of course there's a big part of the crisis still, still in there. So they now produce this table where they construct this instrument excluding six months, nine months, 12 months, and 24 months, as I, as I understand it. And what you see there is that this coefficient really doesn't move all that much unless you go really far out. And if you take two years, you're really like far outside of the crisis. Okay, so, so that is, is um, I think, potentially the most um, convincing set of, set of results that sort of expanding that window really doesn't sort of matter that, that much, which, would, which alleviates some of, these, some of these concerns. Okay, so I want to make two um, sort of like sets of comments that, that are related. So, on the one hand, I want to provide some background about what are the fund fundamental risks during this period. And kind of the key takeaways are that you see that there are significant risks in the insurance sector during this period, and that does a lot of heterogeneity. So the risks are concentrated in just a couple of companies, and that those were ver very much affected. And that those companies that were risky during this period, the risks were mostly coming from securities lending and from variable annuities, and that those companies that were large in those areas were also uh, active players in these uh, extendable uh, 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 funding agreement based notes. Okay? Um, and secondly, I want to talk a little bit about like, how you would think about sort of disentangling beliefs from, from fundamentals in this, in this context. Okay, so, um, so Stefan was, was, was kind enough to send me the list of companies that they have and how much of these uh, XFAP and uh, 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 contracts they issued. And what I did, I linked it up with the, with the, um, with the regulatory filings in terms of variable annuities and in terms of, of, of securities lending. So what you see over here, these are the top 10 companies in terms of variable annuity sellers in 2007. So that's right before, before the financial crisis. So these are the account values. So for instance, AXA has like 179 billion in variable annuities outstanding. What you see in the next column is the losses that were experienced on variable annuities or in the annuity business relative to the equity of the company. So for instance, one company that was hit very hard during the financial crisis with variable annuities was, was Hartford. And you see that they lose about half of their equity during the financial crisis. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you see that the final column sort of shows how much of this, um, of this extendable notes that they, that they had. You see that the account values are they're relatively small. So it was mentioned that MedLife is, is, is the largest, is $5 billion, But MedLife is just like a huge, huge company. Okay? So $5 billion for them is... Is, is still relatively small. Now what you see is that if you, take, if you look at all the companies that were doing variable annuities, they lost 9% during this period. Those companies that didn't have these guarantees actually like recorded a small, a small gain on their annuity business. Okay? The second that I think is more closely related is securities lending. So here um, you may have heard about the fact that AIG was, was kind of big in this space. So AIG lost a lot of money on their CDSs. Uh, they also lost a lot on, on securities lending. So this is the amount of securities lending these companies were doing. And 
the next column tells you the capital gain that these companies recorded, again, relative to the equity of the company. So for instance, AIG was effectively wiped out entirely already based on, based on securities lending. But the thing that's particularly interesting is that now if you go down this, this column, you see that for some of these companies like Allstate, they, they lose 50% 50, 50 of their equity during this period, which um, I never quite understood given that their securities lending was quite small, but then you see that they're actually a, they have a bigger exposure to these alternative notes. And that's what I mean with that it's, this is a really important paper to sort of like put all the different pieces together that we understand the plumbing of the insurance sector so we know what they're doing and how these different activities uh, contribute, contribute to, to the risk of, of the sector. Now, the second thing is to note is that, that these insurance companies during this period were, were, were going through like significant uh, trouble. So we know AIG and typically people say, well, AIG was, was doing all kinds of things that were not representative for the insurance sector and probably stuff they shouldn't have been doing. But AIG was not alone. So during this period, Hartford, the one I showed you before that experienced large variable annuity losses, Hartford also received TARP money. And there was a whole series of other companies that in the middle of the financial crisis acquired banks if they didn't have one. Once they acquired banks, they applied for TARP money. When the Fed said like, no, that's not how this program works, they actually got rid of the banks again. <laughs> okay, so there were a lot of companies that were so financially constrained during this period that they went out of their way to get government support. Okay, so at that point, I think there is a serious concern about solvency. If I would be investing in these companies and I can pull my money out and park it somewhere else, I think it's a very reasonable concern. Okay, so this is not, I think, some minor disruption of payments. I think there was a serious concern about some of these, some of these companies. And in fact, NYU has this very interesting sort of systemic risk measure, and these companies show up very highly even, even today. Now, this is not just the US. In Europe, there's also a lot of evidence that there was regulatory forbearance during these periods, and in some countries, like the Netherlands, uh, some of the insurance companies were, were nationalized. So now how does this li link back to what, what this paper is trying to do? So we're really trying to separate to some extent or conditional on identify the role of self-fulfilling run runs. So the idea really here is to say, well, the self-fulfilling run is really something that entirely based on beliefs. So I have, if I think there's going to be a run, then um, uh, and other people um, have the same beliefs and they may run and that then the whole thing is going to be um, confirmed. And then they say that this is in contrast to this fundamental based run where, for instance, it is driven, the run is driven by changes in liquidity demand or information about the liquidity of, of an issuer. Now, one question I have is to what extent you can sort of disentangle those. And so the thought experiment is, is, is the following. Suppose you have two insurance companies that are identical. Okay, so they issue the exact same policies. They invest in the exact same assets. Now both of them have like two of these SPVs, but they differ in terms of like the fraction that's runnable, that's the fraction that's runnable from today until, until next quarter, okay? Now what that means is that if, if a shock, if the same shock hits these two insurance companies, then in one case where there's a bigger share that you can run on, my beta, my exposure to that, um, to that shock is simply larger because now I'm a junior debt holder as opposed to when I, when I take it out, take it out now. So it seems to be the case that risk exposures, or think of it betas, are correlated um, with, with the future withdrawal of these, of these liabilities, or the possibility that, that, they with, that other people can withdraw on these liabilities. So what that means is that effectively by shorting on this like, fraction that you can run on, in a way you're shorting on, on risk exposures. Now I think it is, like, the situation that they have is, is, is nicer than, than what I'm describing here because they have multiple um, of these vehicles per insurance companies and they have like month uh, insurance fixed effect. But a lot of the stuff happens here within, within, a, given, within a given month. Um, so in the model, everyone is risk neutral, so there's no role for risk. But as a result of this um, link between exposure and the fraction you can run on, the risk return trade-off changes and, and that may uh, affect your decision. And you can, uh, the question is whether you think of that as fundamental or, or self-fulfilling runs. Now I think there's, there's a way to sort of get, I know, to make some progress on that maybe. So one is to see if you can link withdrawals to exposed outcomes. So can you show that if you sort insurance companies on the ones that, that experience the largest withdrawals, what happened to their capital and surplus during the financial crisis? What happened to their, to their equity? Now of course that's only one, one path, but at least it would be nice to show that there is no strong link between, between those two, uh, which may well be the case. And secondly, it'd be nice if there's some information on prices. So we, we sort of had some contact about this. We emailed kind of about this. And 
it seems hard to get information, but even if there's information in prices at origination to show that these companies were really exactly considered to be uh, very similar, then that information would be helpful, um, I guess, as well. Okay, so summarizing, I think it's, it's, it's a great paper on, on an important topic. Um, like the, the thing that I want to emphasize is that I think there was significant stress during this, during this period. I think the paper does make the convincing case that the structure of these liabilities uh, matters uh, and has an impact on, on, the with, um, on, on the withdrawal behavior of other investors. However, I'm not sure how to sort of disentangle it from, from the impact on, on the risk return trade-off, but maybe if you can link it to future real realizations and show that that, that, that link is, is, is weak, uh, then they may help to, um, to make that case. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to discuss Amit and Doug, and great job. The first two papers I thought were really great, and I think this paper is actually really great too. Um, I thought that uh, this paper is really quite nice, actually. It's, uh, you know, I, I put on the last slide something that I'll just say right at the beginning, and that is, you know, Jim Paterba at some point when I was a PhD student gave me the advice that if you show a slide, the summary statistics, and they're new and no one's ever seen them, then you're in pretty good shape, actually, because whatever you ha have after that, at least someone, you know, you can walk away from the paper knowing you learned something. But this paper goes far beyond that. It's not just about a new market that uh, we didn't know much about, maybe Ralph knew a lot about, but most of us probably don't know a lot about. But it also actually answers a really big picture, important question. Uh, so I really would want to compliment the authors. So what's the big picture question? Um, it's one that I just use the author's words, and that is, liquid liabilities are potentially vulnerable to swift changes in investors' beliefs about the actions of other investors. When investors withdraw based on their beliefs and their action leads other investors to withdraw, then the original belief is verified and a self-fulfilling run has occurred. Such a run is in contrast to a fundamental-based run. Uh, and actually, Ralph's last comment is really interesting, actually, so I'm, I'm curious to see what the authors say about that. I hadn't thought of that. So uh, hopefully there's some complementary points in both discussions, but it is kind of interesting because I would call that probably part of this. I don't know if I would call it self-fulfilling, but surely that means part of the liability structure matters. Um, what I'm going to focus on, really, uh, given that my uh, given that there's no way I know as much insurance about insurance as Ralph does, I'm going to focus mostly on the empirical strategy and what I thought was really nice about it, what I thought was some drawbacks on it. But just so everyone understands, I mean, this is a really hard question. Obviously, Doug has done the foundational research on runs, but actually isolating whether we think there are self-fulfilling type runs empirically is incredibly hard because in the data they're almost always correlated, right? These, uh, uh, you know, not to offend Doug, but sunspots, you know, they're nice from a modeling device, but usually we kind of think there's some fundamental shock and then it's amplified by the run dynamic. And so empirically it's very hard to distinguish those things. So is it possible empirically to demonstrate that an investor's decision to liquidate, conditional on fundamentals, is a direct function of beliefs about other investors' uh, liquidation decisions. I took probably three quarters of the time I spent on this discussion trying to understand the institutional environment. So I, I'm, I'm guessing that some of you are still wondering exactly how it works. Um, uh, so let me go through it because I, first of all, I do actually think it's really interesting and second of all, well, you know, there's some value theory of, of, of labor here, so I want to I tell you. <laughs> I want to I brag about what I learned here. Okay? So what did I learn here? So he went through this, but I'll go through it again, because I think I am going to go through the empirical strategy quite, uh, quite in quite a bit of detail. So I'm sitting here in an insurance company thinking about whether or not I want to spin off my security. Okay? That's the first thing that's kind of confusing here. It's not like a diamond day big model where I liquidate for cash. I essentially decide whether or not I want to spin off my security into a security that then matures in one year. So it's, it's right away I was kind of confused, like, well, this isn't really a run because you you're still going to lose your money if they, if, you know, if they run out of money within a year. But the issue is everyone's facing that decision. So everyone who's running is not really running as much as they are spinning off their security that they could choose to roll over and instead choosing to allow it, uh, you know, to get the fixed income instrument for a year and then they'll get paid out, okay? So it's not exactly a bank run like you think of it. It's kind of a spin-off run. Like I, I, you know, but then it, obviously the other guys could do it before you. So you just kind of delay the liquidation decision for a year, which is what Doug was, you know, they had that back and forth about why October 2008 is when uh, they go to the FHLB. Okay? And my decision, I have an election date here when I can decide whether to spin off, and then I have election date here uh, to spin off. And these could be, they say, usually a month apart. Okay? 
And then what I'm considering here is what other guys are going to do in the interim that are for the same insurance company but different classes of XAFBN, uh, extendable notes, so that they may actually decide to spin off their security in that interim period. Okay, so anytime I say spin off, it kind of means run, but not really because there's a year of wait, right? Uh, but I'm going to use that term spin off because that's what they use. So the instrument is going to basically be that when I'm deciding here, I'm going to be informed about how many other guys in the insurance company can potentially spin off between my election dates. And then you might say, well, why are you even doing this T plus M, T plus M plus 1 nonsense? Well, the reason you have to do that is because that's actually when I'm going to get paid. So when I decide to spin off my security, I get the cash at T plus M from the new security. Okay, so everyone on board? That's why it's kind of strange. So I'm worried if I decide to roll over that in the interim, these guys are going to decide to spin off. And then I'm not going to get paid until T plus M plus 1. And in the interim, all these guys are going to get paid. So it's kind of a run, but it's kind of a year delay. Okay? That's kind of how this whole thing works. The OLS estimation then is going to be doing DIJT, my decision whether to spin off or not, uh, as a function of how many guys decide to spin off in the interim period between my election dates. I'm right about that, right? Is it monthly or between election dates, right? So T is kind of defined by election dates here. Okay. What are my comments? Uh, my first comment is going to be uh, that we need an instrument. And this is kind of reviewing stuff that both, uh, both uh, Stefan and, and Ralph said. So I'll just do it quickly. It's kind of obvious here that OLS isn't going to work. Um, a fundamental shock to any given insurance company at t equals 0 will quite obviously affect both how many withdrawals happen between my election dates and my decision at time 0 whether or not I want to spin off. Okay, that's kind of obvious. Um, the authors make a valiant attempt, although in the, dis in, in the presentation he was a bit more modest. I think Stefan was a bit more modest. In the paper they kind of try to say, oh, no, even the OLS with all these controls is pretty convincing. I don't know about that. I mean, it's a valiant attempt, but at the end of the day, no matter what you control for, the investors see more than the, uh, the econometrician sees. So any, that correlation is always going to be polluted by the fundamental shock. So, um, you know, sometimes we have this whole joke about the identification police in corporate finance and people care too much about identification. But in this example, you're going to have to, right? I mean, it's just such an obvious alternative story that you really are going to have some kind of, you're going to need some kind of clean source of variation in order to do this estimation in a convincing way. And they're very clear, as you saw in the presentation, that they understand that. So what is the instrument, just to make sure everyone understands it? I'm not going to deal so much with this three-month issue, because I think the authors handle it really well, and the, and, the, and the table Ralph showed shows that it's quite robust. So I just want to make sure everyone understands the basic instrument. The basic instrument is the maximum fraction of XFABN that can be converted into short-term fixed maturity bonds between my elections, right? So it's this thing. Okay, with this three-month uh, addition that they kind of try to get it so it's not polluted by short-term decisions. Okay? It's plausibly exogenous to fundamentals, but increases the risk of run conditional on the same fundamental shock. Now, here I had a discussion with the authors between, so maybe I'm not right about this, but at least, I mean, theoretically, I guess you could get runs even if there's no fundamental shock. That's kind of the classic model. I kind of think, if I'm thinking about the power of the first stage in the time series, that the power of the first stage is really going to only work when there is a fundamental shock. Right? Does everyone see that? Because if there's no fundamental shock, again, in the models, there's sunspot equilibria, but in the real world, it's kind of hard to imagine that all of a sudden guys start running when there is no fundamental shock. So that's why he said very carefully it's about estimating the effect of runs conditional on some fundamental shock. Okay? Now, that brings me up to a point that I don't have on the slides because I didn't. I thought I was limited on time, but I think I have more time than I, than I think now that I'm looking at my slides. You could imagine empirical strategy completely different, and that's the one I thought would be uh, as interesting as the one they did, where you exploit variation in investors in the XFABN that are getting their own shocks that are orthogonal to the fundamental shock getting received by the insurance company itself. Everyone see that? So that would be another way of kind of trying to find some variation in I respond to other investors. That's actually more typical of kind of the way research is done in that corporate finance area is, you know, there's some investor in MetLife that I learn is going to have to, has a big shock, and I know they have their withdrawal decision in the interim, so therefore I withdraw. So that's another way of thinking about perhaps a situation in which there's no fundamental shock at all to MetLife, yet there's still going to be a run. 
right? So I was thinking through examples of maybe when you could do that, but um, they don't have the data, unfortunately, on who holds the exact securities. Or maybe they do, I mean, we'll see if they do something like that. I thought they didn't. Okay, so what is the variation in the instrument? One of the emails I sent the authors was just to say, because they have this line in there that says, it's usually monthly, and so I said, well, if they're all monthly, then there's no variation in the instrument, right? I mean. If every time everyone has a monthly election, even if we're, our elections are staggered, that means 100% of the guys are going to have an election between my time and my next election. Um, so they have some really cool variation, right, which he didn't go through in a lot of detail, but there's, there's really cool variation here, right, because first of all, as you saw in the example, oftentimes when you issue the thing, the first election's not for a year, and then they start monthly, right? Likewise, when it matures, oftentimes there's no election in the year before maturity. So you've got this kind of nice variation across insurance companies. I think the authors could do maybe a better, exam, a better job of really showing it to you, maybe graphically at different points in time, what the variation looks like. They did it in the presentation, but I think it should be in the paper as well. So what's my take? This is a really cool instrument, and the authors really should be commended for finding this institutional environment that allows us to test such an important idea. I mean, it's, it's a really nice institutional environment. It's one of those few situations uh, that make great papers where the instrument itself is kind of interesting, but it's not just about some dinky little question, but it's about a big question, right? So you both have kind of a cool strategy and a really big question that's actually being answered with it. So what's my second main comment? My second main comment is um, that they should really focus on the summer of 2007. My view is that you know, nothing really interesting is happening there. And so specifically, uh, let me skip that, what I would do um, is if I were actually writing this paper, at least as a first pass, maybe in addition to what the authors are doing, is don't run the panel regression, but actually do the first difference specification, right? So those of you who know my work know two things. I like first difference specifications and I like pictures, okay? So the reduced form would be this R, E, I, J, and then you would have your decision to invest, and I would do this at like August 15th, 2007, right? So the, ho the hope is that you've got 13 insurance companies that are all coming up for election, and you've got the reduced form, which is you've got the instrument, and you want to see how many guys are withdrawing. And as a result, you basically, hopefully, it looks something, I mean, it probably would look something like this, right? And you'd have 13 observations here, essentially, because that's how many insurance companies they have, okay? I think this is a much more transparent way of doing this exercise. I think the panel regression, you kind of are losing some of the information. I mean, this actually is losing the information, but it's actually making it very transparent where the variation is coming from. I think the first stage is going to be much stronger because this is where the fundamental shock is occurring. And so I think this is kind of the way I at least think about it uh, when I'm thinking about the empirical strategy. Okay? Another advantage of doing it this way is you're going to have a much stronger first stage. Right? I mean, you're weakening the first stage by including 2005 and 2006 where nothing's going on because that's just showing up as zeros. REIJT has no predictive power over whether I withdraw because of course there's no fundamental shock, so I don't care. Right? So you're really isolating the time period where the power's coming from. I'm not saying get rid of the panel, I'm just saying do this maybe in addition. I also think it's easier to conduct orthogonality tests because then you have the reduced form, then you can start correlating REIJT in say August of 2007. You can correlate it with a bunch of stuff in 2006, 2005 and show that it's effectively exogenous to everything. I kind of believe it's exogenous just in the, the strategy and the robustness test, but I think that would be more convincing. Finally, if you show it on a graph like this, we can see uh, perhaps if there's nonlinearities more easily. You can see that perhaps it's really if there's 100% of the stuff is you know, up for election, you really get a big increase in my decision to, to uh, delay. Um, but that, I think, would be uh, more transparent, at least should be an addition. I won't say you have to replace what you've got, but I think the panel right now, I mean, you look at a picture like this, it looks like really all of the variation, most of the variation, I guess there is some interesting stuff between 2008 and 2009, but certainly prior to 2007, there's not, it doesn't look like there's anything going on in this market at all. So I mean, what, are you, what are you getting from looking at this period? Right? Maybe to just pin down control you know, betas, but that's, that I don't think is really where the power is coming from. Let me make two final comments, one I have on here and one I thought of while you were presenting. Um, the timing still bothers me, so let me just go over this quickly. The ideal experiment that I, I, I think of when I think of this paper is this kind of all 13 insurance companies on August 15th have at least some investors in their extendable notes who are making a rollover decision. But the problem is in reality they don't have that kind of variation because it's like a staggered panel. So I don't know how, much, how close they get to that. But really what you have is you're comparing MetLife on August 13th, so those guys are making a decision 
and whatever Hartford on August 17th. And even though that's a small difference in time, it's not the ideal experiment that you want. I can't think of exactly why I'm bothered by it, but anytime you don't have the exact experiment you want, you kind of worry even high frequency stuff, right? Maybe the Hartford guys are responding to what happened to the MetLife guys, and so it's just not obvious that you have as a clean of a, a setting. The final comment that I want to make in my remaining time, which I just thought of actually as he was presenting, that magnitude estimate's too big, I think. Your estimate's way too big, I think. Let me just show you why. So they had this 80% of the withdrawal is due to, um, is due to, to the shock, to the, to the self-fulfilling prophecy element, uh, the self-fulfilling run um, element of it. So the way they get that just graphically, if you imagine you did it like this in a, in a cross section where it's easier to see. So you have REIJ, and then you have SIJT plus one, okay? From what I can understand from where they get that calculation is we know this is the first stage, right? So this is, the, this is how many guys run, I'm sorry, how many guys spin off as a function of how many guys could have spun off, okay? And they get an estimated line like this, okay? That's beta hat times SIJT plus one, okay? Everyone with me? Right? I'm right about that, right? What they then do is they add up all of the mass under here. Okay? Right? That's what they do, and they say, this number gives me a number of how much of the withdrawals were due to the election you know, cycle and therefore to the self-fulfilling part. The problem with that is you've got to choose a control group. You can't add up all of them, right? So you've got to pick the guys who have the lowest REIJ, and you can't assume that for those guys that was all self-fulfilling. So the way I would do it is I would say, choose that as a control group. At that point, who knows what's going on down here? That could be both fundamental or self-fulfilling, but you really can only assign the self-fulfilling part here. Right? Because you're assuming, I mean, obviously there's a whole bunch of withdrawals even for the control guy, and you're, you're assigning all of them to the withdrawal, to the self-fulfilling part. But that, I mean, we know that at least some of that is going to be part of the fundamentals base. Does this make sense? Hopefully this makes sense. But basically, you can't, you can't basically just draw the whole, this is the same kind of thing Atif and I do in a bunch of papers, right? You've got to pick a control group first when you're actually doing this calculation, okay? And then you can assign the rest of that. So you can say, the control group tells me that at least this, uh, this much of it was due to fundamentals, and the rest of it is due to the self-fulfilling part. Because 80% sounds ridiculously large to me. I mean, I, I understand self-fulfilling runs are important, but 80% of the withdrawals in this market, I mean, Ralph showed you, these guys are getting huge fundamental shocks. So it's hard for me to imagine that it's all uh, based on self-fulfilling stuff. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks.